Hello again and welcome to The Power of Language in Sexual Trauma Therapy, Words That Oppress and Words That Heal. A word is not just a word. A word brings to mind feelings, can trigger reactions, invites images and sensations. Because therapy for sexual trauma is about working with survivors of trauma, our words matter. I don't know if you started to notice it yet, but I always try to replace the word victim with the word survivor when I'm talking about sexual trauma. Victim simply means a person who is injured as the result of a crime. So why is it something I need to worry about using? Again, it's that idea of connotation. It's not what the word literally means, it's what the word brings to mind. When you hear the word victim, what comes to mind for you? You might come up with words like passive, hurt, small, ashamed. Whether or not you do, I would guess most survivors would express that's how they see that term. They see a victim as someone who is acted upon, who has had something happen to them against their will. So every time that word comes up, they may be reminded again of that feeling of helplessness. It comes from being the survivor of sexual abuse or assault. Sexual abuse or assault expresses to the abused person that nothing about you is your own, that you have no power even over the most intimate part of your physical self. It's not like being a victim of theft where there's vulnerability, but there's still not that same physical invasion. Before abuse or assault, if the survivor can remember that time, it's likely it never really crossed their mind how intensely vulnerable they could feel. But now they have that possible reality in their head, and the word victim just seems to make it all worse. On the other hand, a survivor is someone who has been through hell and back, who has chosen to reclaim him, his or her life. A survivor is someone who still maintains control of their soul, which they choose that the abuser can't touch. A survivor, while simply meaning by definition that someone has made it through, carries the connotation of someone who is triumphant and powerful. That's exactly what we want our clients to feel because in truth that's what they are. And I've found out that it's a really neat thing a lot of times when you have the opportunity to explain to a client why you're using the word survivor. Because then you can take the opportunity to say, because I am so impressed by your commitment to healing, or how you've chosen to take a difficult situation and not let it define you. Though I believe that's just stating the truth, we may, in truth, be the first person to ever express it to them that way. And it's a truly humbling gift to be able to do that just by the changing of one word. Another area to consider the use of words is in the area of rape trauma syndrome versus PTSD or CPTSD, which is complex PTSD. I only learned the word for complex PTSD this month, so let me explain that in a little more detail. Complex PTSD will not be found in the DSM, but has been the subject of several journal articles, such as the one in the Journal of Traumatic uh, Stress back in 1997, which identified the sexually abused women as having a higher risk of CPTSD. Ultimately, it just means that stress comes from prolonged exposure to traumatic incidents, like long-term childhood sexual abuse or captivity, as opposed to a single incident. Rape trauma syndrome is a term that's been used for expressing the progression women go through to recover from a rape. A three-stage journey from the acute stage, in which a person feels extremely emotional, shuts down from shocks, or projects that everything is just fine. Then on to the outward adjustment stage, which means exactly what it sounds like it means, and hosts some of the most uh, PTSD-like symptoms. And then the third stage, which is called resolution. In the final stage, this, the survivor supposedly moves on. You will also not find this definition in the DSM, although it's often explained as a type of PTSD. 
I personally have never used the words rape trauma syndrome in my work with a survivor, and I don't really use it for any of my research or prep before a session. I don't think it's a bad definition. I guess I just have never seen, seen the need for it. It describes many of the same symptoms of PTSD, but separates them out into a whole different name that doesn't really fit a good portion of survivors because a lot of survivors are women or men who've been through prolonged sexual abuse as a child, not a single incident to react to. The word trauma overall is extremely helpful and it's involved with both names. I personally define trauma as the brain trying to process something it just wasn't made to understand. Because the brain wasn't naturally equipped to understand this, like it's equipped to understand something that would be somewhat normal, like the death of an elderly person, we expect something like that. But when we're faced with something that we're not expecting, it tends to freak out. Um, these issues are things like war, child abuse, and sexual trauma. They're just strange things for our minds to deal with. So we can have all sorts of unusual reactions, like scanning the room for potential threats, nightmares, and generally feeling unsafe. These kind of reactions are explained in both names because they both use the word trauma. But here's how I perceive the debate of rape trauma syndrome versus PTSD or CPTSD. In my opinion, it's hard enough to express to other people what survivors go through without creating a whole separate name for them. There's nothing intr intrinsically wrong with the idea of rape trauma syndrome, but I feel like it reduces the impact of what happened by putting it off to the side. Though they are very different experiences for the individual while they're happening, the results of sexual assault and something like war are very similar. I've worked with soldiers from Iraq, as well as many survivors of sexual abuse and, ass and assault. They both react the same way. They might block memories out, scan the room, have nightmares, etc. So I choose not to split them up and instead try to validate the experience for the survivor by expre expressing their symptoms as post-traumatic stress through either CPTSD sexual abuse survivors or PTSD for single incidences. When a person is raped, they are also sexually assaulted. But sexual assault is not rape in every case, as assault can happen on many different levels. Each word has a purpose in the therapy office, but wisdom is needed on how to best utilize the names. The word rape has certainly been around for a long time. The word origin is to take by force or to seize prey. Those are accurate descriptions in some cases, but not all. The idea of rape historically is associated with being seized by force, threatened physically, or attacked in a dark alley. Again, these could all absolutely be true. But sometimes the dominating idea of physical attack does more harm than good to the survivor. Why? Because people still think that how much you fight back defines whether rape happened or not. Among the worst of those who still believe this lie are the survivors themselves. They will berate themselves for not knowing how to react and just staying still or for being under the influence of alcohol or drugs. In my experience, I found that there's not just the two traditional ways to react to a threat in the case of sexual assault. There's not just fight or flight. There's fight, flight, or freeze. If you think about this, this has precedence in nature among animals who play dead to avoid being attacked. Enough people I've spoken to have had this kind of reaction to convince me that it should be a real thing. Freezing is a perfectly logical, self-protective response in many cases, if you think about it. For, for example, if you struggle sometimes and the person is big enough, you could get hurt even more. You could also go into shock and not be able to physically control yourself at the time, which could be a response your brain turned on in order to keep you from getting more hurt than you already were. 
Rape asks the question to some people still, what were you wearing? How did you act? Here's the thing, an intoxicated person cannot give legal consent. So no one should get a free pass because their victim was drunk. And a man or woman with integrity can stand in front of a person without any clothes on and still choose not to take advantage of them. So those arguments are just garbage, but they still exist out there and our clients live in that world every day. Giving them a new name for an old problem can really help them redefine their experience in terms of the assailant, not in terms of themselves. It can also help hold accountable perpetrators whose crime may not fit the legal definitions of rape, but is another kind of sexual abuse or assault. It's survivor-oriented instead of survivor-blaming. The final category of words we're going to look at today are names for the offender himself or, or herself. In this case, I don't believe there's any one word that's superior to another. They just mean different things to different people, and it's up to the therapist to evaluate how his or her client responds. Perpetrator is usually a legal term and can help a client distance themselves from an event in a situation where they need to regain control. You might use this word at the end of a session when a client's about to have to re-enter the world and needs a, a little distance, or at the beginning of your relationship while they're still getting to know you and before they're ready to be vulnerable with you. That can be a safety thing. The word rapist, as opposed to the word rape, can be a helpful word for clients who need to label what happened as clearly wrong. It can be hard to accept that at the beginning of a person's healing process, but that word can also be helpful later on to clarify. They may need to hear that what happened was not a miscommunication, that the person who did this was not a friend, they were a rapist. Abuser generally refers to the idea of past abuse and can have some of the same benefits of the word rapist, but maybe a little gentler and more appropriate for a longer term abuse. It can be a step up word to labeling a rapist or a standalone definition. It just depends on your client. Ironically, the word abuser may be accepted before the word abuse is accepted by the client. But that can be a gateway for you to define their experience as abuse and explore the implications of that. The word him is somewhat misleading because a number of perpetrators are women, and we can't pretend otherwise or leave out a whole section of the population who are victimized by women. But in this case, I just mean using a general pronoun, him or her, for a person instead of their name. I don't force a, a client to relive an assault or get details about an abuser right away. I feel like that's more oriented about my wanting to understand the situation than their need to go through the healing process. So I don't force that on them. I believe it will come out on their own. But clients will not often volunteer that information. The moment that they do volunteer it, can be a really good indication of how far they've come in taking back their power over what happened to them. That, in my experience, has been the moment the client generally goes from a state of fear of their perpetrator to a stage where they feel more in control. So now that you've heard some of my views on words in sexual assault therapy, what's your thoughts on how you will use words with your sexual trauma clients? Is there another word that might come up that you have a question about? Comment on the blog below by clicking on the article and scrolling down to the comment section. I'll see you again next week when I talk about to tell the story or not to tell the story. The question of uncovering the abuse story in sexual trauma therapy.